Hello, everyone. So today we're going to continue our conversation about the spontaneity of a chemical reaction by moving on to isobaric conditions. So last time we developed how we can determine the change in universal entropy under isochoric conditions by making use of the internal energy of the system. However, we often as chemists love ourselves some isobaric conditions because most of the time we're working at about a constant one ATM. So this can essentially be accomplished by taking our old, uh, old system of looking at the change in entropy of the system and the change in heat of the system under our isobaric conditions, which is the same thing as the change in enthalpy. So again, by convention, we'll typically drop any reference to the system by simply referring to the change in universal entropy of the system be, can be given as the change in enthalpy of the system minus the change, in, uh, the change in entropy of the system minus the change in enthalpy of the system divided by temperature. So in order to uh, determine the spontaneity of a system, it's often a little bit, again, messy to use the uh, change in universal entropy. So instead, what we do is same thing we did for Helmholtz. We multiply by negative t, and this will isolate uh, our expression as <laughs> negative t times the change in universal entropy which is the same thing as the change in Gibbs free energy, which can be given, given by the change in enthalpy minus the temperature times the change in entropy. So again, a much, a very similar expression to what we derived for Helmholtz. However, it is worth noting that the Gibbs free energy is officially designated not in the differential form, but instead just simply as Gibbs uh, equaling the enthalpy minus temperature times the entropy, which does actually give a more full description of the non-isothermal uh, definition of change in Gibbs as the change in enthalpy minus SDT minus TDS. Because again, we have to allow for some variance of uh, temperature of the system. So while we're typically working with Gibbs under isothermal, uh, isothermal conditions, it is useful to have the non-isothermal definition. However, just like Helmholtz had a def had a alternative physical meaning of being the same thing as the maximum amount of work a system can accomplish, we also see something very similar for Gibbs. So for Gibbs, we can essentially start with this differential description of the Gibbs equation based on enthalpy and the change in entropy and temperature. And then what we can do is insert in the fact that enthalpy can also be given as the change in internal energy plus dPV, which is again going to be the same as PdV plus VdP, uh, which we've dealt with previously. So we can then again insert our first law description for the internal energy as the sum of work and heat that can be accomplished by the system. All right, so at this point we have, well, quite a long expression. However, we can quickly start essentially uh, using this to drop terms. So first of all, if I have a, <clears throat> if I have an isothermal system, well, what ends up happening is we're able to uh, drop our change in temperature expression, and we see a cancellation of uh, dQ equaling uh, uh, TDS, which we also saw for the uh, Helmholtz free energy. And then that just leaves us <coughs> our description of the Gibbs uh, free energy being equivalent to the maximum amount of work the system can accomplish, plus PdV. So again, we can use a lot of the same approximations we used for Helmholtz uh, to get us down to this simpler description, which again gives us more or less our Helmholtz description plus this dPV expression. Now at this point, we can essentially split our work into two definitions. We can define our work as being able to perform either PV work 
or non-PV work. So PV work is the classic expansion work we've been talking about so far this semester. However, we also have things like non-PV work. So this might be work that goes into, say, breaking or making chemical bonds that can go into driving electrical current or even just working against the potential field. So there's actually a lot of very interesting things in this non-PV term. In addition, we can go ahead and split our DPV term into PDV plus VDP. Then, if I'm working under isobaric conditions, we find that VDP cancels out, and then all we're left with <coughs> is this DW plus PDV plus the non-PV work. Well, turns out we can also give our PV work expression as negative PDV. Uh-oh, negative PDV, positive PDV. Well, these two are going to end up canceling out which means that we can, through all of these long simplifications, refer to our change in Gibbs free energy as pretty much the maximum amount of non-PV work the system can accomplish. Now as chemists, this is actually a very nice definition because we often don't care about how much energy goes into PV expansions. We care about what's the maximum amount of energy I might be able to use to say drive a chemical reaction or drive a current that can be used for electrolysis or in another electrochemical energy generation technique. We don't often care as much about pistons, so instead what we care about is how much work I can use to drive chemical reactions. And for that, what we really want is our Gibbs free energy and not the Helmholtz, which is one of the reasons why a lot of our discussions from here on are really going to focus in on this Gibbs idea, as it's going to be much more the usable work that can be used for chemical reactions. Now, in order to say try and determine our Gibbs, uh, Gibbs energies, it's worth noting that because our Gibbs energy depends on our enthalpy, we often can't end up, we often can't describe our true Gibbs energy of a system, just like we can't describe our true enthalpy of a system. Instead, we're often gonna define our Gibbs uh, energy for a system based on the Gibbs of formation. So very much similar to what we did for enthalpy of formation. So this is gonna give the free energy of forming a chemical species from its component elemental forms in their standard state. So again, this is almost the identical definition we developed for the enthalpy of formation. However, one of the things that you should make note of is that when determining the Gibbs uh, energy of formation on the enthalpy of formation, we also need to make sure that we're using the entropies of formation. So again, when you're trying to deter, if you have the enthalpies of formation and are trying to determine your Gibbs free energy of formation, Make sure that you're using your entropies of formation and not your third law entropies. This can be a very important difference to make. Now, another alternative is you might be able to look up the Gibbs formation of an independent chemical species in, say, a nice table like the CRC. So using these values you look up, you can determine your uh, Gibbs free energies of reaction simply by essentially doing products minus reactants because we love state functions and our ability to just determine any change based on products and reactants. So let's go ahead and kind of look at this difference, these differences in how you can determine Gibbs energy of reactions by looking at a relatively simple reaction of going from, say, acetylene under exposure to hydrogen gas to produce uh, ethane. So we can essentially determine this reaction through several different approaches by making use of our enthalpies, entropies, and Gibbs free energies of formation. So one of the simplest ways we can go about this is simply using our Gibbs free energy of formation and going about products minus reactants. So in this case, it's actually fairly straightforward as the Gibbs free energy of formation for, uh, the Gibbs free energy of formation for hydrogen is going to be zero. So I can essentially just do ethane 
minus uh, acetylene. So when we do this, we find a very favorable reaction at about negative 242 kilojoules per mole. However, we can also derive our Gibbs free energy of formation using our, our Gibbs energy of reaction, using our enthalpies of reaction and our entropies of reaction. So these two can be determined by essentially products minus reactants for both our enthalpies and our entropies. So uh, when we do this, we go ahead and find <coughs> that our enthalpy of reaction is going to be about negative 311 kilojoules per mole. So again, a very favorable enthalpy and a negative en entropy of formation of negative uh, 23 uh, 233 three joules per mole Kelvin. So an unfavorable entropic term, which again makes sense because I start with three gas phase species and make one. So I'm favored by the amount of heat I'm producing, which is going to disorder my surroundings, but I'm also uh, disfavored by the fact that I'm having to order my system itself. However, it turns out that in this case, our enthalpy is much more important than my entropy because I'm working under a low temperature regime. As the temperature is raised, is increased, this enthalpy becomes much less important. But under these conditions, again, the reaction is still very favorable. And one of the important things to make sure of when you're comparing different methods to determine thermodynamic values is that, again, the path through which you determine these values do doesn't matter. And being state functions, we should always get the same answer, which it does indeed turn out to be true. However, one of the things you need to make uh, to be very aware of is when you're dealing with Gibbs free energy of formation for ionic species. So if I'm dealing with, say, the Gibbs free energy for an ionic species, I can't readily, say, isolate just a proton or fluoride by itself. So instead, when looking at the entropy, uh, the free energies of formation for these species. Instead, what we end up looking at is the enthalpies of formation for the combined aqueous complexes. So say something like HF from hydrogen and fluoride. So this has a Gibbs free energy of formation that's again, very favorable. But we can also split this uh, energy in part. So we can imagine that the Gibbs free energy of formation for this a combined complex is going to be the Gibbs free energy of formation for the proton plus the Gibbs free energy of formation for the fluoride. Now here's where convention becomes very important because by convention our free energy of formation for a proton is going to be zero which in this case means that all of the energy of formation belongs to the fluoride ion. So this is actually a fairly important constraint to keep in mind that in order to determine the energy of formation for an ion, we're gonna to need to first determine the energy of a combined species, and then you're going to need to know one of uh, the energy of the other ion. So this is actually a fairly simple case if one of the ions is a proton. However, things become a little bit more complex if your cation is, well, anything else. So how would I go about determining the free energy of formation for this combined species. Well, based on my reactions, I can determine the free energy of formation of sodium fluoride as negative 594.5. But I can also express this as the combination of my sodium ion and my fluoride ion. Well, because I know the free energy of formation of hydrogen fluoride, I know the free energy of formation of the fluoride ion. So you can essentially use this combining of ions to determine the free energy of formation for any other cation besides hydrogen. So in this case, it's really going to be the energy of formation for the sodium fluoride ion minus the fluoride ion, which again gives me a free energy of formation of sodium of negative 261.9. So again, this is one of those ways we can use the energies of individual of use the energies that we know 
to figure out the energies that I want to determine. So if you don't have a value, um, a thermodynamic value that you directly want, a good alternative is to figure out what values can I combine together to get the new value I actually care about. So we're going to be developing this idea a lot more with diving in full force into thermodynamic cycles next time. Till then, take care.